Welcome to another episode of Cassis Belly Baby, your host Cam Ray. We last left off on Scythian and Cimmerian weapons. Today we'll look at the Cimmerian and Scythian bow and arrow. We'll also look at the shield at the very end. Let's start off with the bow and arrow. The Scythian Cimmerian bow is unique and revered throughout the ancient world by kings, historians, and a philosopher. King Ashardan of Assyria had a Cimmerian bow. The Babylonian armies of Nebuchadnezzar II and Nebuchadnezzar were equipped with their bow and arrows, and even Hercules' Greek portrait displays him with an armed displays him armed with a Scythian bow. The Greek philosopher Plato said, quote, The customs of the Scythians prove our era, for they not only hold the bow from them with their left hand and draw the arrow to them with their right, but use either hand for both purposes. End quote. Plato's description shows that the Scythians were indeed expert archers, like, like the Japanese samurai who were one with the sword. The same could be said about the Scythians being one with the bow. The weapon was indeed a favorite among the later Mesopotamian empires. What made this weapon special is quite interesting. The bow used by these nomads does not look like anything special when viewed. But back when it was a new, threatening, and revolutionary weapon, it would slowly replace the angular bow used by the Assyrians and much of the Near East. When, the, when Assyria fell, the Cimmerian and Scythian bow was the bow of choice among civilizations. Its use spread from the Iranian plateau, made its way westward through Greece, and finally reached the shores of Italy. The bow used by the Scythians and Cimmerians was no ordinary composite bow. It is small compared with later bows used on the steppe and is made of horn or wood and strung with animal tendon or horsehair. Horsehair may have been the Scythians' preferred material for stringing the bow. Horsehair is better than animal tendon strings, which tend to stretch if they absorb moisture in colder climates. Like on the steppe, stringing the bow was a difficult process. In order to string the bow, a Scythian archer must utilize both legs and arms, as, as, you'll, see in the, as you'll see in the image I'll provide. According to the Greek mythology tale of Hercules and his three sons, the son who can string and bend the bow can stay in the land, but those sons who cannot string the bow will have to leave the land and go somewhere else. Both the oldest and middle son could not string the bow, but Scythes, Hercules' youngest son, bent and strung the bow and is allowed to stay in the land that is named after him. The arms of the bow curved outward from the handle grip, resembling a Cupid's bow. Strabo compares the bow's shape to the Black Sea. The tips of the bow lacked ears, giving it more flexibility. The length of the bow is approximately 80 centimeters or 2.6 feet in length, while other bows found in burial mounds throughout Russia measure around 127 centimeters or 4.2 feet. Overall, the Scythian double curved composite bow is small, stiff, hardy, and powerful, but how far could the bow de deliver an arrow? There is no Greek grave at a place called Olbia, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, a former Greek colony on the Black Sea, which is located on the Dnieper Bug estuary. The inscription on the grave dates around 300 BCE and makes a claim that the bow, uh, th that the arrow delivered by the bow traveled roughly 521.6 meters or 1711 feet which is little more than 567 yards according to the inscription, once it's all calculated. This is an incredible distance to say the least, but in combat the Scythians had to be effective and accurate when concentrating on a single target. Unless the target was a massive target, in which case you need not only to hit someone at random. Example, the Battle of Carre in 53 BCE. For a Scythian archer to be effective in killing or wounding his enemy, he had to be at a distance of 160 yards. However, to be lethal, he had to be at least 160 to 200 feet away. In addition, they would, also, they would carry anywhere between 30, 150, and some estimates say up to 200 arrows in their quivers. When engaged in combat, the archer could release up to 12 arrows a minute, while others suggest 20 arrows a minute. But of course, this would depend on the nature of the battle. The Scythians were not necessarily, ne not necessarily looking for the one shot, one kill. I am sure they would take advantage of the opportunity presented itself. The Scythians in battle would position their bow at a 45 degree angle. From this angle, they would shower the enemy with arrows to kill if possible, but mutilation would be the main object from such a distance. Arrows from this dis distance would fall erratically on top of the enemy. 
due to the distance of the shot, the intention would be to demoralize the enemy and hope that the enemy forces would withdraw. If the enemy withdrew, the Scythian horse archers could begin to pick apart the enemy with individual kill method or leave him alone entirely. Not a bad method. It shows us one of many reasons why those who encountered them so dearly dreaded their bow. An example of this reigning death is at the Battle of Cari in 53 BCE between Rome and Parthi. Dr. Kava Faraki suggests that the average Parthian horse archer with a quiver of 30 arrows loosed between 8 to 10 arrows a minute at Cari. It would take 2 to 3 minutes to exhaust his arsenal before needing resupply. The amount of Parthian horse archers at the battle is estimated at 10,000. Now, if all 10,000 fired away for 20 minutes, the amount of arrows fired by an individual horse archer would have been between 160 and 200 arrows. Take 10,000 and the amount of arrows fired upon the Roman soldiers are estimated to have been an astounding 1.6 to 2 million arrows in a 20 minute time frame. The Scythian bow was the AK-47 of the ancient Near East and the weapon of choice to dominate the battlefield. Even though the bow is unique and designed to deliver the most damage, utmost damage, the arrow the bow delivered was even nastier. The Scythians uniquely designed their arrowheads for maximum penetration of the opponent's armor. Beyond that, Scythian arrowheads were extremely poisonous. Before we pick our poison, we must pick our point. The Scythian arrowhead, also known as a Scythian point, is, a, is of a trilobate shape. The design of the arrowhead looks like a, uh, is like a rock or bullet. It's got three blades protruding from the body. Some of the arrowheads had protruding barbs, while others did not. The trilobate was usually made of bronze. The shaft used to deliver the arrow the arrowhead was made of reed or wood, roughly 30 inches long. The design and craftsmanship in producing such an arrowhead is brilliant for its aerodynamic body and makes it practical to use against the finest and toughest armor. The Scythian point originated around 7th century BCE. This could suggest the Scythians developed a point in order to pierce Assyrian armor at the time in question. Scythian and Cimmerians were indeed at war with Assyria off and on during 7th century BCE. Now, this is not only the arrowhead style or metal used by the Scythians, for some arrowheads were made of bone, stone, iron, and bronze. As for the shape, some look like small spearheads, while others are leaf-shaped, which may have been used for hunting. Others are trilobite-shaped, as discussed, most likely used for combat purposes. Besides the lethal design of the Scythian trilobate point, another nasty feature was the use of poison. Not only were they experts at archery, but also biological warfare. The land the Scythians inhabit is home to a number of snakes from which they can draw venom. Such snakes inhabit the area include the steppe viper, Caucasus viper, the European adder, and the long-nosed sand viper. The Scythians had a vast arsenal of snake venoms of all degrees at their disposal. The book titled On Marvelous Things Heard by Pursuto Aristotle, which was a work written by followers if not written in part by Aristotle himself, mentions the Scythians' handling of snakes and how to extract poison. Quote, They say the Scythian poison, in which that people dips its arrows, is procured from the viper. The Scythians, it would appear, watch those that are just bringing forth young, and take them and allow them to put putrefy for some days. End quote. After several days passed, the Scythian shaman would then take the venom and mix it with other ingredients. One of, one of these con concoctions required human blood. Quote, but when the whole mass appears to them to have been to have become sufficiently rotten, they pour human blood into a little pot and, after covering it with a lid, bury it in a dung hill. And when this likewise has putrefied, they mix that which settles on top, which is which is of a watery nature, with the corrupted blood of the viper, and thus make it a deadly poison. End quote. The Roman author uh, Alien, I won't say Alien, but I think but I can't pronounce some of these guys' names. Alien also mentions this process, saying, "Quote: The Scythians are even said to mix serum from the human body with the poison that they smear upon their arrows." End quote. Both accounts show that both accounts show the Scythians were able to excite the blood in order to separate it from the yellow watery plasma. Once the mixture of blood and dung had putrefied. The shaman would take the serum and excrement and mix it in with the next ingredient, venom, along with the decomposed viper. Once the process is complete, 
the Scythians would place their arrowheads into the deadly mixture ready for use. The historian Strabo mentions a second use for this deadly poison. Quote, the Sonys used poison of an extraordinary kind for the, for the points of their weapons. Even the odor of the, this poison is a cause of suffering to those who are wounded by the arrows thus prepared. End quote. I suppose one could get used to the reek due to being around it day in day out. On the other hand, poisonous fragrance may take longer to get accustomed to, especially the receiver of the arrow, since all things deadly are alive and well on the tip of an arrowhead. Even though the even though the arrowhead is poisonous, the barbs of, of, on the arrowhead are sometimes poisonous as well. The Roman poet Ovid, who was exiled to the Black Sea, got a good look at these poisonous barbs and describes them as quote. Native arrow points have their steel barbs smeared with poison, carry a double hazard of death. End quote. He also describes the poison ingredient as quote, yellow with viper's gall. End quote. To get a better understanding of this double death, uh, Renat, Renate Roll elaborates further on the barbed arrowheads. Quote, These arrowheads, fitted with hooks and soaked in poison, were particularly feared, since they were very difficult to remove from the wound and causing the victim great pain during the process. End quote. A very grim picture without question. To be stuck, to be struck, and stuck, by an arrowhead with barbs or hooks that is poisoned with putrefied remains are indeed horrific. However, I wonder if the Scythian, archer use, Scythian archers use different types of poisons on each individual barb or hook besides the main poison on the point itself. With all these different poisons used by the Scythians, they had to know how to tell what was what was what in their uh, gortus. I, I believe I'm, I'm pronouncing that right. I'm going to say I'm going to just say their quiver. This quiver is a, is or gortus is the case that held the bow and quiver of the arrows. Okay, the length of the gortus is re relatively shorter than the bow itself, leaving the bow partially exposed. The gortus also had a metal covering for the arrows. This is most likely to protect the archer from scraping his skin across the poison's arrowheads. The Scythians would paint their arrow shafts in the color of red or black, while others had a zigzag or diamond pa patterns painted on them. These various patterns painted upon the arrow shafts are the same patterns found upon various vipers used by the Scythians as their agents of death. Uh, vipers with a zigzag or diamond pattern upon their back are the most poisonous of all. Adrian, Adrian Mayer on pay, if you go to page 84 of her book, Greek Fire, Poison Arrows, and Scorpio Bombs, illustrates the various snake patterns used by the Scythians. The painted design is a way for archers to tell which poison he is using. I also agree with Mayer that the painted arrow shafts, when fired at the enemy, likely had a psychological effect. For They must have looked like snakes flying through the air, while the barbs protruding from the point may have looked like fangs to the enemy. It's probably, it's probably one hell of a sight. All right, shields. This is the last part of it all. I probably should have covered shields earlier on, but I totally forgot about. But you know, heck with it. Shields. It goes along with bow and arrow. I mean, when you look at the Scythians when they fire their bow and arrow. They have a shield right there on their arm. So let's go ahead and discuss about their shields. The Scythians carried small shields for the most part. The shield utilized was round and a little over a foot in diameter. It's not exactly big by any standards when you look at it. The Scythians did carry much larger shields of various shapes. Other shapes all include the uh, crescent shape that the Greeks depict in some of their artwork. The shields were made of wood, for the most part, and covered with iron plates or a reindeer skin. Some of the shields were just plain. There's no image of any kind. Other shields had decorations of deer and fish, which seemed to be the image of choice, but other animal images were, were used as well. The practicality of the shield's size is important, for a, shield, for a small shield does not hinder the rider in performing his actions when loosening, loosening his arrows, which is likely repositions to his back during engagements. On the other hand, the shield would be useful to the rider on foot if the horse were cut down from underneath him when engaging the enemy. However, the size of the shield shows us that the typical Scythian horse archer is not made for heavy infantry close combat, unless all other options have been exhausted, of course. The same might be said of the heavy cavalrymen, since their role is to puncture holes through the enemy lines, as in the description of Massengate provided by Herodotus, or the description Plutarch provides about the Parthians at Cari. Both historians suggest, descriptions suggest that if a heavy cavalryman is knocked off his horse, 
he is not capable of protecting himself efficiently due to the weight of his armor. Well, I hope you like that mini lecture. And I hope you really enjoyed this mini lecture series on weapons and armor and whatnot. I could always go into more over it all, but I'll let you guys decide. And you know, if you want more of this, I'll try to come up with even a longer list of things I can come up with about Scythians and Cimmerians. I do have quite a bit. You can also find quite a bit more actually in my book, uh, March of the Scythians, which came out, I believe, in 2013. You can find that at Amazon.com. So if you like this mini lecture, give me a thumbs up. Leave your comments down below. No fighting, of course. And um, I don't know what we'll have next time. Maybe we'll go into some particular battle. Maybe we'll look at the Battle of Kari, for instance. It, it might end up being a long lecture. So anyways, thank you for listening. And until next time. Oh, before I go, I'll leave the references at the bottom at the, in the description. I'll leave references in the description, and if you want to check out my website, it's www.camrea.org. That's www.camrea.org. Thank you.